everybody, and welcome back for episode number 30. Today will be our Halloween 2020 special. Before we get this thing started, you know what to do. Like, share, subscribe, and follow us on all of your favorite listening platforms. And if you guys have a story and you'd like to share it, send it to jwcarterfilmworks at gmail.com. Or send it to our Facebook group, Mysteries and Beliefs Podcast with John Carter. Yay. Today's episode, I'll get my chance to tell my stories. Lisa did her Halloween stories, what, two episodes ago? Episode number 28. And today will be my turn. I'm ready. All right. I will be talking about three horrifying murders that were committed on Halloween. And these are all Mm -hmm. true stories. Oh, okay. Even before I start that, episode number 29, we talked about my dream or sleep paralysis. Yes. I like to preface that that shadow figure that I spoke of on episode number 29 did return. Do tell. No, I'm not going to tell. I'm going to, because you didn't get a chance to see it. I wanted to wake you up. I'll give a brief synopsis of what happened this morning. Yes. I was awakened about maybe six o'clock in the morning before the sun came up. I saw the shadow. Nope, nope, nope. Back up. You, you, we both awoke around 3.13. Remember when I said, look at your watch? I'm not sure what was going on, but the both of us, Lisa and I, woke up about that time in the, the morning. The same time. The same time. I spoke about this on episode number 29, so I'm not going to go into details about that one. But with the shadow figure this morning, it was about six o'clock in the morning before the sun came up. I woke up. I saw the shadow figure on the ceiling again. I thought maybe it was the trees from outside. Or cars. Could be the cars. Or cars. But if it's a car, it will go by. The shadow would go away. True. But the shadow was constant and it was kind of like just kind of slowly moving kind of up and down. Right. But staying in the same general location. Sure. I watched it for a while. I tried to kind of debunk it with the lights and things in the room, but there wasn't really any light. So I said, you know what? I will pick up my cell phone. I'll turn on a video and record it. What I wanted to do prior to that was to wake you up so you can see it, but I didn't want to startle you because you would have got startled. So I picked up my cell phone and I wanted to record it. Yeah. As soon as I touched my cell phone, the screen came on and of course, All you guys out there have a cell phone. It just lit up the wall. I turned the light off on the cell phone and the shadow was gone. So right there, it debunked me thinking that it was a tree from outside. Did it come back? It never came back. I sat there and watched it. It didn't come back. I saw you move around a little bit. And this is when I told you what I saw to make sure I wasn't sleeping. Mm, Yeah, thanks for waking me up and keeping me up. Now, if anybody has some suggestions, what we can do about that or what that may be, please send it to us. I said to email at the beginning of the episode, hit me up on to your stories. My first story is going to be about the Napa murders. Napa. Yep. Napa Napa Valley, Valley, California. Yep. On Halloween night 2004, three friends, Adrian Exana, Leslie Marza, and Lauren Menza, were handing out candy to kids at their home in Napa, California. Seems legit. And about 11 o'clock that evening, the three women, they just went upstairs and went to bed. Right. Lauren, which was sleeping in a bedroom downstairs, woke up to screaming from the upstairs. Okay. She got up, she ran upstairs to see what was going on. 
she found both her friends bleeding on the floor. She ran out of the house, drove away, and left both her friends behind. She saw a man leaving the scene, but it was too dark to see who it was. What was strange about this encounter, the man did not sexually assault any of the women or didn't steal anything from the house. So the detectives, as they were investigating, they followed a bunch of false leads. So okay. they couldn't really find anything well, because, again, it was strange that two women on Halloween in their bedrooms were stabbed to death. Here's the thing. Why would you just leave? Wait, wait, wait. Let me back up. Definitely it was a good idea. If you saw something, you would be like, I'm out. Okay. I Let me rewind before you ask any more questions. Okay. When she saw her friend's dead bleeding sure they weren't dead at that moment when she saw her friends bleeding she called 911 and left the home for fear that it was going to happen to her oh okay got it that okay. makes sense yeah sure all right so the police gathered about 218 dna samples and conducted over a thousand interviews and came to a dead end okay a thousand interviews and nobody knew anything at all that's a lot I know. Jeez. Somebody knows something. Well, but it was dark in Napa, and, and those houses are probably all spread apart, too. Sure. So that would maybe be the case that no one saw this person because the houses may have been spread apart and it was dark out. Right. At some point oh. during the 11-month-long investigations, detectives turned their attention toward the DNA evidence. Okay. So on the scene, they found camel Turkish gold cigarette butts outside the women's house. Since none of the three women smoked, it was probably the attacker who sure. was smoking the cigarettes. Right. Unless it was the gardener. Yeah, true. <laughs> but I mean, they, they would probably cleaned up. I'm sure. You know what I mean? Right. If you paid a gardener in Napa, California, Listen. and they didn't pick up cigarette butts, you'd be fired. And maybe they did. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but the detectives asked Lauren Menza, so she was a survivor of it. Okay. Did they know any smokers? She mentioned the name Eric Koppel, but she didn't suspect him at all because Eric had helped them move into their apartment and also attended Leslie and Adrian's funeral. Right. You know, but who I'm would saying just like, do that? Who would go to a funeral, though? I'm saying. Yeah. If, if somebody did it, why would they turn up at their funeral? Sure. But. Through the latest breakthroughs of forensic science allowed the investigators to ob obtain specific DNA on the cigarettes. Okay. This is how specific it was. They found that the smoker probably had blue or green eyes, light colored hair, and from Northwestern European ethnicity. Sweet. Okay. I know. If they can do that, you better. You guys, if you're doing crimes, you better stop. Exactly. And this was back in 2004. Right. Once the information became public, Eric Koppel, the guy I mentioned, yeah. turned himself in and confessed to the police. Wow. On September 28, 2005, he, along with his brother, Tim, Lily, and his parents, truck down to the police station because Eric's appearance matched the physical description on the DNA that they indicated. Wow. Almost exactly. During the interview the night he turned himself in, Eric told the police several times that he didn't remember exactly what happened. Alrighty. But he did tell the police what he remembered. Right. After midnight, he stood out the women's house. Right. And smoked a couple of cigarettes. Right. He climbed in the downstairs kitchen window and went upstairs and stabbed Leslie Marza and Adrian and Sonia to death. Wow. He told the police that he drove home afterwards, burned his clothes, and does not remember what he did with the knife. To this day, he never gave a motive or told the police where the knife was. Interesting. At his sentencing, he expressed that he had depression and had suicidal thoughts throughout his life. Okay. Now, the possible motive, which, again, he never gave a motive on why he did this. Eric Koppel's fiance, Lily Perdome, canceled their plans to get married in Hawaii. With the wedding off, Lily and Adrian planned a trip to Australia together. And Adrian is who again? Adrian is one of the girls that was killed. 
Oh, Adrian and Sana, which I'm was there. her best friend. Got it. Eric and Lily were arguing about their breakup at a party that they both attended separately on Halloween of 2004. Okay. So that's the same night. Oh. Lily and Adrian worked together. They're colleagues. Colleague. Yeah, they were colleagues. They worked at Napa Sanitation District. Okay. And they both were close. So some of the stories said that they were best friends. Okay. Adrian was also friends with Eric as well. Okay. He didn't exactly say so, but some sources told investigators that he suspected Lily's friendship with Adrian contributed to the breakup. Oh, that's too bad. Eric and Lily eventually mended their relationship and they were married in February of 2004. Adrian and Sana's mother read scriptures to the newlyweds during that ceremony. Wow. But see, they were still investigating. Sure. Because it was only February of right. 2005. After Lily found out that Eric did the murders, she never condemned him for it. Really? No. At Eric's sentencing on January 12, 2007, Arlene Allen, the same mother that read the scripture, the read the scripture, yeah. gave a statement at court. And this is what she said. My baby never wore a turtleneck sweater in her life, and yet she was buried in one. And still, it could not cover the extent of her wounds. Wow. Lily, now Lily Koppel, also made a statement. What did that say? The <laughs> well, if she didn't do it, so why would you I'm say that about her? Because her husband killed someone. She didn't need to say nothing. Zilch. Sorry, go ahead. Adrian and I were good friends. Arlene and I have grieved together. Our relationship bond was stressed when Eric confessed, but it was not broken, she said. I know a gentler Eric. She went on to blame her husband's actions because of depression and alcoholism. Oh, of course. I know. Nice scapegoat. She also said, there's more. I sent Eric into a violent explosion, but mm -hmm. he has paid the debt through Jesus Christ, she said. In the days before he confessed, I knew something was terribly wrong with him. I told him, Eric, there is nothing in this world you, wouldn't, you could do that would make me stop loving you or love you less. She. These words are just as true today as they were that afternoon. Isn't that crazy? That's trifling. Yeah, it is. Now, of course, her and Eric Koppel can't be together anymore. Right. <laughs> sure. But what was so strange about it that she kept his last name. There's no She way. remains friends with his family also. Nope. What was his uh, sentencing? Did you get any information on that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Eric escaped the death penalty by agreeing to spend the rest of his life behind bars, waiving the rights to appeal, and agreed to never profit from the two girls' deaths. Perfect. He can't even talk about it. The only people that he can discuss it with is with his clergy and his family members. That's it. Wow. He can't talk to anybody that's mentioning a book or no, a movie, no nothing at all. Perfect. If he violates this, all the money goes to the Calvary Home for Children in South Carolina and F Given a Chance Foundation in Napa. Those are two nonprofit organizations that the families chose. Okay, good. So now Eric is serving a life sentence in Pleasant Valley State Prison in Colinga, California, without possibility of parole. Good. How many years? I wonder how many. Life sentence. 10, 10. Life with no parole, meaning you can't get out till you're dead. Okay. A life sentence is 20 years for federal. For, for federal. So a life okay. sentence without parole, meaning that you don't get out of jail. Okay. So that's why he didn't get the death penalty. Got it. I know. That sucks, though. Maybe, why would you do that? He must have definitely been stressed out about it. He must have thought, I don't know. He may have had that blind anger. And that's what it probably was. No excuse. He saw the, you know, these two girls being close. He yeah. was already friends with this girl also. 
So I wonder if he heard something from people mm -hmm. that Adrian was the one who broke their broke up. Them up. Yeah, still not worth it. No, I mean, uh, yeah, this is why it's a horrific murder. Sure. I wonder if he's paying the price in jail. You know what, what I do mean? You mean? Like, like to other men or something like that? I mean, you know, getting beat up and all that stuff. You know what I mean? I wouldn't think he would get any different treatment because most of the time in prison, they beat up child molesters. Sure. Those are the ones who they go after. Right. Or Ooh, people are just in jail. Put for... in jail and where he lived and everybody knows the story and then they beat him up. You know what I mean? No, you're going too far fetched now. Maybe. You ready for story number two? Sure. Story number two. This is a, a popular story. These are old stories, too, in which a lot of you guys out there may not have heard these stories before, but it's a good Halloween story to tell. This one is called the Toolbox Killers, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. The reason why they got their name is because the pain they inflicted on their victims with tools. Tools. Yeah, yeah. got it right. Regular household <laughs> tools. Lawrence Bittaker was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on September 27th, 1940. Steelers Nation, baby. Yay, yay. <laughs> yeah, although just on my team. As an unwanted child of a couple who did not want children, he was adopted by Mr. and Mrs. George Bittaker as an infant. Lawrence's adoptive father worked in the aviation industry, which required the family to move frequently throughout the United States. That's nice. Yeah, that is Get to nice. See the but world. do you know how sometimes they say military brat? Yeah. It's the same thing. It's because they travel around and kids sure. end up getting into trouble. That makes sense. Yeah. Fast forward a little bit. Within a year of Lawrence dropping out of high school in 1977, he was arrested for hit and run and evading arrest. So he became a bad boy, a juvenile delinquent, a vagrant. He was locked up in California Youth Authority, where he remained until he was 18 years old. So I wonder how old he was when, in 1957. When he was released, Lawrence discovered that his adoptive parents had disowned him and relocated to another state, and he never saw them again. Good. Lawrence Bittaker was considered by some being more of a terrifying monster than Charles Manson. Oh, wow. Now, this is... Well, Where, he wasn't a cult leader. This, no, but he, no, he wasn't a cult leader. But I am skipping over a lot of stuff that he's yeah. done. The reason why is because I'm just telling a Halloween story, the Halloween murder, but giving a little background about these murderers or okay. the toolbox murderers. Sure. So when he was locked up behind bars, he reveled in his style of what he did with you know oh, he was he was with the tools so they called him pliers bittaker oh he was like yeah let me show you what i can do with these things. so that was his moniker so back in the day if he would probably have a prison tattoo of, of pliers on of his pliers or a wrench that's the first of the two toolbox killers a little background on the second of the bunch roy norris was born in greeley colorado february 5th 1948 Roy was born out of wedlock to parents that didn't want to have children. Just like Lawrence. But because of the stigma of that day, his parents did get married. Oh, wow. And they probably didn't even want to get married. They just had an oopsie. Back in the day, <laughs> in the 40s, illegitimate children sure. didn't bode well. Right. So they decided to get married. From the stories that Lewis would tell about what he remembered about his childhood and his biological parents that he was given, well, he, first of all, he was neglected. Sure. Because of course, if they don't want kids, the same thing people do with pets, they abuse pets and they neglect pets right, right, right. and they do the same thing to children. So eventually they gave him up for adoption. Okay. So he did live with foster families throughout his, his life. young life. Sure. Even with the foster families that Lewis lived with, they abused him. They denied him food, didn't give him sufficient clothing. Neglected him. They neglected him. Yeah. yeah. Point blank. Wow. He also claimed that he was sexually abused when he lived with a Hispanic family. Mm. So that's the reason Again, I'm not giving a whole bunch of background. No, he was But he has a prejudice Dark. against Hispanic people. Oh, okay. When Lewis was about 16 years old, he moved back in with his biological parents. How nice. I know. He went to go visit his family. He had a 20-year-old cousin that he started speaking 
in a sexually explicit manner to his own cousin. Can you believe that? Ew. I know that that is gross. She ordered him to leave out of the house and she did tell his father what he said to her. When his father threatened to beat him, he stole his car and drove to the Rocky Mountains. Nice. <laughs> he tried to escape. But during his... Maybe he didn't feel like it was her fa- he That was his family. But go ahead. Well, yeah, that's true because he never lived with them. Sure. So if he just moved back in, right. maybe... He didn't you know, realize that, that, that... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, but go ahead. Sorry. But, you know, just He's reading... He's in the Rocky he's, Mountains. Yeah, he he screwed up anyway. Yeah. But again, when his father threatened to beat him, he drove to, he stole his car, drove to Rocky Mountains where he had tried to attempt at suicide. He tried to inject air into his arteries in his arm. Well, that is one way. That is a way. But people don't realize you have to push a lot of air in your veins in order for you to die. We do a study at work called a bubble study. Yeah. When we do push air into the veins. No, it doesn't. Oh, what's that thing that I got that one time? They put, they shot the air. No, they don't shoot air in it. Is what, what they oxygen. do. Yeah, oxygen saturation. They do a blood gas is what it's called. It was hurtful. They put a big needle in your, usually in your wrist. Yeah. To get that into that artery to get the blood gas. Yeah, I Numbers remember. from that. But anyway, we'll talk about totally medical different, stuff. But go ahead. Later. So he was caught by the police. Right. Before he was able to commit suicide. Sure. They sent him back home. Right. At some point when he was at home, his parents told him and his younger sister when they became adolescents that they were going to be divorced. When they became adults, you mean? No, adolescents. So meaning when the children get to a certain age that they, as their parents, were going to separate and divorce. Well, he's 16. So, I mean. His younger sister may have been a little bit younger than him. Okay. So maybe because you know how when they wait till what's the age of adolescent? Eighteen. I don't know. I I don't know because it depends on what state. All right. But okay. because you can actually go by the I'm, physical I'm attributes they of it at, of age. But of age. But sure. I don't know. But this is what the story says: as adolescents. Okay. So maybe they were waiting for the sister to get or both of them to be about 18 years old okay and then they were just going to split okay so but they actually did divorce when they were just teenagers now you asked this earlier both lawrence bittaker and lewis norris met and became pals when they both were in prison in 1977 now this is how they became friends which you knew was going to be a messed up thing they both became friends based on their hatred for women and they both fantasized about raping and murdering women all right. Okay. You talk about a ride or die partner. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess. So now this is where the rubber meets the road. On Halloween night in 1979, a 16-year-old Shirley Linford was abducted outside of a gas station hitchhiking home from a Halloween party. Which is not heard, unheard of back then. Yeah, back then in the 70s. People hitchhiked all the time. Yep. People believe that she accepted the ride from Lawrence and Lewis because she recognized Lawrence from the restaurant she used to work in as a part-time waitress. Oh, okay. Pulled over and said, hey, get in. Get in, babe. Sorry. Now, the two men, Lewis and Lawrence, picked her up in a white van. It's always a white van. Uh Uh-huh. She was offered marijuana the sticky icky weed or whatever by Lewis, but she refused it. Lawrence was driving and they drove to a secluded street. When they got there, Lewis, which was in the back of the van with her, tied her up and gagged her with construction tape and pulled out a knife. This is, I don't want to say the F word, but this is effed up. Lawrence traded places with Lewis and drove for about an hour while Lawrence was in the back of the van with Shirley. Okay. He removed his construction tape from her mouth and her legs and tortured her. He slapped her, kept mocking and hitting her, repeating and shouting, say something. So now when Shirley was screaming and pleading, she was screaming, no, don't touch me, don't touch me. Yeah. So in response to that, he hit her again and told her to scream louder. Mm. Which was all also screwed up with these guys. He began hitting her with a hammer. Oh, my God. And his fist in her breast. So he was alternating back and forth, hitting her with his fist in her breast and with a hammer in her breast. And then he raped 
and sodomized her repeatedly. Wow. She pleaded for him to stop, but it just continued. Kept going and going. At that point, he took out the sludge hammer and a pair of pliers out of the toolbox. This is even more screwed up. Is it going to get when really When he gross? did that, okay. they were recording it. So you could hear video recording. No, just audio tape recording. Okay. He pulled out the, the sledgehammer, pulled out pliers, and you can hear it in the back of the van. So you can hear on the tape her screaming. You can hear him hitting her. After he was done, Lewis switched with Lawrence and he got into the back of the van and turned on the tape recorder for himself, too. I mean, this is kind of tough because this is you could have can't imagine this is a real story. But he got into the back of the van, he turned on the tape, and then he shouted to her, go ahead and scream. I'll make you scream. Wow. So again, she started pleading with him. So just like Lewis, she was pleading with Lawrence to stop and please don't hurt her. She's begging for her life. So she's pretty much begging them to stop. Right. The same thing, you can hear him reaching into the toolbox to get the sludge hammer. This is messed up. With that sludge hammer, he struck her in the elbow with it and hit her in the elbow repeatedly. In the elbow? He hit her 25 times repeatedly as she pleaded for him to stop. Wow. My gosh. And then he had the nerve to ask her what she was sniveling about. My goodness. One of them, I can't remember exactly which one that was saying during a a court statement that we all heard women scream in horror films, but we all know that they're really not screaming. Why? Simply because the actress can't produce the sounds that are convincing to us that something heinous is happening to them. This is what they were referring to when they were listening to the audio Audio tapes tapes of what happened. Sure. So, I mean, they both were describing the recollections of what had happened during that night that they abducted her. Yeah. I mean, they pretty much just flat out tortured her. Both of them raped her. They beat the shit out of her. And then they just dropped her off on somebody's lawn. Wow. Did she survive? No, she did not. That's why it's a Halloween murder. Oh, sorry. My bad. How long did she survive? How long did did she survive? Is there anything that says that? Like... No, no, they, uh, uh, she probably died. They, cause when you they, mean they probably died in the van before they dropped her. Yeah. They, she probably died in a van before sure. they dropped her off because that makes sense. They were torturing her. Some of the things that I, I did research didn't say specifically the time of death or sure. what, did she die in the van or right, did right, she right. die on the lawn when they found her? Got it. But of course these guys at that point, they weren't suspects for this crime. So they weren't apprehended. That was the first of many. Well, that was one of many. Oh, okay. That's why I'm not going to give a date that they were in prison or anything like that. Okay. For these crimes, because uh, eventually they were popped for it. Okay. If we do a toolbox killer's full story, yeah. I'll have that. This happened all on Halloween night in 1979. So that's number two of our Halloween special stories. All right. Three. Give it to me. Number three, the Candyman murders. You already posted something about the Candyman murders. The Candyman can. Mm, The Candyman can. (laughs) On Halloween night in 1974, Ronald O'Brien and Jim Bates took their children out for trick-or-treating. Trick-or-treat. The kids went up to a house and knocked on the door, but the lights were out and nobody answered. Got it. So the kids, they got, they were greedy, of course. So they ran off because no one was answering the door to go to another house to get candy. But Ronald disappeared. When Ronald caught back up with the group of children, he had in his hand those pixie sticks. Okay. Do you remember what they are? I remember pixie sticks because I'll tear them up if I ever see them again. So if you guys don't know what a pixie stick is, it's a long straw with just sugar in it. Pure. That's all it is, is pretty much sugar. But different flavors. Different flavors. Grape. Yeah. Red. The red. Yeah. Well, they shouldn't be purple, (laughs) red, yellow, blue, and all that stuff. Different 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 colors. Different colors for different names. (laughs) That's all that was. 
when Ronald caught back up with the group, he handed out the pixie sticks to all the children that was there. His son that was with him, Timothy, was allowed to have one piece of his candy before he went to bed that night. He chose a pixie stick. Nice. He opened the pixie stick up, but the pixie stick was lodged because sometimes if it gets a little moist, the sugar doesn't come out. Right. So his father helped him dislodge the pixie stick. Okay. Timothy complained that it tasted funny. So his dad went to get him some Kool-Aid to wash the taste down. Sure. Less than an hour, Timothy O'Brien was dead. Oh, man. Former Harris County prosecutor Mike Hinton was working intake is what they used to call it at the police stations back in the day. They got a call that there was an eight year old boy that was dead. When he got the phone call about the eight year old being dead, he called Dr. Dechimchak. I know I butchered his name, but he's a medical examiner that he wanted to examine the boy's body. So while on the phone with the doctor, he asked the prosecutor what the boy's breath smelled like. He made a phone call to the morgue and they told him that his breath smelled like almond. Right away, the doctor said it's cyanide. Mm -hmm. When they did an autopsy on the boy's body, they found enough cyanide in his body to kill two people. Wow. When they were investigating the boy's death, they found that the pixie stick was packed with cyanide. Trifling. When the police found out that the pixie sticks had cyanide in them, they found all the children that was given that pixie stick that night. They found all but one. The pixie sticks were tampered with and when they put the poison in the pixie stick or the cyanide they stapled them together they found one boy the last child with the pixie stick asleep in his bed holding the pixie stick and the only thing that saved his life was he was not strong enough to open to open it with the staple in it so ronald was the one who gave the kids the pixie sticks he said he had went back to that house where all the lights were out and no one answered the door. Right. But someone was home. This is what he told the kid. Okay. He told the police that that's what happened, but he couldn't remember which house it was and he did not see the face of the person who gave it to him. Okay. The prosecutor, Michael Hinton, got frustrated because he wasn't cooperating with the investigation. So they picked him up again and they took him back to the neighborhood. But all of a sudden, his memory was jogged. So he remembered which house it was. The person that lived in his house worked at Houston's William Hobby Airport. They went down to his job and arrested him in front of all his coworkers. The thing about it is... Yeah. He had an alibi. They had turned out the lights because the only people were there was his daughter and his wife. They ran out of candy and he was at work that night. The day of Timothy's funeral, he was acting kind of weird. Ronald had written a song for Timothy. The song was about meeting Jesus and meeting the Lord in heaven. Okay. That's nice. He got pissed off at his family members because they didn't want to stay up to hear the rendition of his song (laughs) when they played it on a broadcast on television. Okay. He wanted it to be a superstar. He wanted his five minutes of fame. Yeah, he wanted his five minutes of fame. He wanted to milk this. But the the prosecutor, Michael Hinton, was kind of um, taken back by that and thought that was strange. At some point during this investigation, Michael Hinton used to teach at the police academy. Okay. When he was teaching a class, he got a knock on the door by the detectives that they had recently found out that Ronald had took out $10,000 worth of life insurance on each one of his kids January of that year. Trifling. On top of that, a month before that Halloween, yeah. he took out an additional $20,000 on each of his kids for the life insurance policy. Wow. The investigators knew that he was in debt for over a hundred thousand dollars Good gracious. so they called the insurance company to see if he filed a claim on timothy's death of course he did what she did yeah that wasn't enough evidence at that point right and even back then they couldn't put the pixie sticks in his hands or he was the one who made the pixie sticks right because There was no DNA testing back then, and there was no credit card, so they couldn't track down the credit card. They couldn't trace the pixie sticks. They couldn't trace who bought the the cyanide either. With this evidence, he was eventually arrested. 
And during the trial, the prosecutor stated that he loved the attention and he loved being on trial. He's a little bit of a narcissist. No, a sociopath. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, how could you, you're on trial for the murder of your child or the death of your child. Right. And then you love the attention. He's definitely a sociopath. What do you call it when you're like disassociated with things that are like directly connected? They don't have the same feelings like you and I have. We mourn. We. You probably we, said the same, the right thing. Maybe he's a sociopath. That's what it is. Yeah. So. Because he's a he's a social disconnect. He can't. Yeah, he can't. You know. Just yeah. But check this out. This is what he said. He entered a plea of defense, blaming that the cyanide laced candy came from an untraceable boogeyman. Oh man! <laughs> and a sick individual who was using the cover of Halloween to poison and murder children. That's terrible. But do you remember when we were younger and we heard about the people lacing? Yeah, I was going to talk about that, that too, because who mentioned that or were we talking about that the other day? We were because I posted about it. Oh, yeah. When you posted about the the Candyman. Yeah. On the website. Yeah. Or on the Instagram. The dad that laced his the apple with the needle. A syringe. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Yeah, I just remember that my parents threw out all the apples and they checked our candy. I know. I remember and also that. ate our candy. And that's well. when people start giving away fruit and stuff like that. Yeah, that's when they stopped. There were some people that still did it, but we but threw they, it away. But they also, they did it to like chocolate bars. They put yeah. needles in chocolate bars and he would find they razors needles, and razor stuff and apples. And I mean, things like that. You, there, there are some sick people in this sick world. I mean, people. why would you do that to children? And I remember going to the other side of the neighborhood and my, and I, my mom said, mm -mm, throw that away. Put, I have already, I have a garbage bag. And we said, we know them. And my mom said, you don't know them damn people. I don't care if you know them or not. She was not playing with any kind of fruit that or candy that looked like it was homemade. There was oh, a lady that made homemade candy. Or tampered candy, with. Or tampered with. If the wrapper didn't look secure, it was out. What's sad about it is there's a lot of people, very good, kind people. Yep. That want to do this for children, but yeah. they can't. They can't. They can't do they it. They can only do it for their family members. That's it. That's it. I remember prior to that, we had the lady that made her homemade candy, and it was great, and we just couldn't have it. Then there was another lady that gave out um, oranges, and we loved oranges. <laughs> <laughs> and most kids said, oh, I want candy. But we were so excited that she, because she had the huge and oranges. Oranges were good, too. They, they still are We just are weren't good. allowed to. And she just, I remember her saying that she didn't have money for candy. It was just too expensive. So that's why she gave fruit. Yeah. And that was sad because she really wanted to, but we couldn't. And to see it go get thrown away. I know, go to waste. Yeah, but it, it wasn't polite to not take go knock on a door and, and they give it to it. exactly yeah so you know back to the his plea so that was a strange uh, uh, that was a stupid ass plea that he right. put in a boogeyman come on man yeah he thought he was the man though he probably did got all his little bit of fame all his friends and all his family all his co-workers testified against him in court and he thought he was the man just like he thought Look he was the man. the notoriety I'm getting. The name Candyman came from the press. Wow. So he's a celebrity. During his trial, they were calling him the Candyman. If I was defending him, I would just, you know, I don't know. So on June 3rd, 1975, it only took 46 minutes for the jury to come back that he was guilty. Too long, in my opinion. His charges were one charge of capital murder, four counts of attempted murder. Um, but he did get the death penalty. He was put to death on March 31st, 1984, shortly after midnight. Okay. By lethal injection in Huntsville Prison. But he maintained his innocence throughout the entire time. He's a sociopath. What do you expect? He felt that the penalty was wrong. And this is a statement from him. God bless you all, and may God's best blessings be always yours. Did he say that? Were those his final words? Those was his words. His final words. His final before... words before they injected him. Wow. Wait, there's more. 
During the execution, there were 300 demonstrators standing outside of the prison chanting trick or treat. That's kind of sick. They also threw candy at people that were out there that opposed the death penalty. Wow. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. That's kind of gross. but That's sick. And I know they made a couple of movies about the candy man. But with different, yeah, I mean, different premises to the movie. It wasn't based on him. There's something out there that's a documentary. All these stories that I told today, of course, I will put in the show notes links and stuff to reference things that I did. I summed up the stories. I hope you guys enjoyed the stories. What say you? I did. Interesting. Going back and a little grossed out, but yeah. Going through the notes, I pieced together a lot of good parts of the story. So it would just be about Halloween and no other. No other murders. No other murders. Nothing else linking to anything outside of Halloween. Sure. In the spirit of Halloween. So you achieved that. Those were my three horrifying murders on Halloween. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.